The second lesson is from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. From the fifth chapter, this is what Paul writes. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Meet us where we are this day, O oh God, and open our hearts to you. Amen. On Wednesday of this week, we celebrate the 4th of July and American independence. And what most of us will be focusing on will be the important questions such as, what shall we cook on the grill, or, or where shall we find some fireworks to experience? Some call the 4th of July the celebration of summer. Yes, it is. But it is also our American day to celebrate and ponder the meaning of our nation's freedom. One of the signers of the Declaration of Independence was John Witherspoon who was an ordained Presbyterian minister, the only clergyman to sign that important document. Witherspoon was then president of the College of New Jersey, the predecessor educational institution to Princeton University and Princeton Theological Seminary, where uh, Neil and I uh, both attended. Of particular importance uh, to us as Americans and as as people of faith, is the idea of religious freedom. So there is this strong link between the founding of our country, the Declaration of Independence, and religious freedom. We started a revolution over the ideals of freedom and fought a revolutionary war in order to establish this freedom. Not only were we fighting to be free from a king, we were also fighting for the ideals of freedom. And religious freedom was at the top of the list. Today, of course, we often take uh, our religious freedom for granted. But the early leaders of the revolution those who wrote our national charter, Sam Adams, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Witherspoon, and 51 others, understood the tyranny of religious persecution and what the absence of religious tolerance meant. The early colonists were mostly European. And Europe had a tortured history of, uh, of persecuting those who had different religious beliefs. Of course, the ones doing the persecuting were in political power. And those in political power defined what was acceptable to believe. So today we are reminded of a history that led to our fight for this religious freedom. For instance, Charlemagne, Holy Roman Emperor during the uh, 800s, enforced a policy of death for every person in the empire who chose not to be baptized, which I'm sure uh, elevated the numbers of the baptismal rolls, right? 
And during the, the Spanish Inquisition, uh, particularly under the reign of General Tomas de Torquemada, which was in the late 1400s, 100,000 people were accused of heresy. 10,000 people were killed, put to death because of that. And thousands of others spent their lives in prison. John Huss, the, the Czech preacher and reformer, was excommunicated for espousing uh, the ideas of John Wycliffe of England, who held that the laws of Scripture were above those of the church. Huss was burned at the stake. Scotsman uh, Patrick Hamilton uh, went to Wittenberg and studied under uh, reformer Martin Luther and returned to Scotland to proclaim Luther's reforming ideas. Not only was he burned at the stake for heresy, but the wood was made wet so that the fire would burn slowly, so that his burning to death took over six hours. For us, the home team was the Protestants. But we have to be reminded that when the Protestants gained power, they returned the favor of persecution. The Reformation and the Counter-Reformation involved persecution from one side to the other. And the ones in political power were the ones doing the persecution. In the early days of the American colonies, the, uh, the Maryland Assembly established the death penalty for blasphemers and for people who denied the Trinity. I sure hope that they didn't ask those Marylanders uh, to explain the Trinity, right? Can you explain the Trinity? Father, Son, Holy Spirit? So by the time of the American Revolution, thankfully it seems, the leaders of the revolution understood the destructive power of religious intolerance, especially when the state aligned itself with a particular religion. And thus Thomas Jefferson wrote, the holy author, God, of our religion chose not to propagate it by coercion, but to extend it by its influence by reason alone. These ideas made it into the Bill of Rights. And the First Amendment says that our American government will not be permitted to make, quote, any law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That was such a radical idea in its day. No country had ever been able to pull off a separation between, between church and state. So, as Americans, religious liberty is one of the cornerstones of our democracy in its establishment. The 4th of July, in celebrating this really important day, is where, for us, religious liberty can be commemorated and celebrated. The gift from our American uh, ancestors was that our government would be neutral toward religion. It cannot hinder religion. It cannot promote a particular religion. But it's an ideal that has often uh, been tested. After 9-11, um, uh, a movement began where the spokesman said this, Our goal is a Christian nation. We have a biblical duty where we are called by God to conquer this country. We don't want equal time 
We don't want pluralism. In one of my early pastorates, uh, I got caught up in, in a firestorm. Our church and uh, some of the other churches in our community uh, had long sponsored and paid for a teacher to go into the elementary schools as a, as a Bible teacher. She would go into the classrooms and uh, read and teach uh, Bible stories to elementary school kids. But a family in, in the community complained to the school board. And when the school board did not stop the Bible program, a lawsuit was filed. Now, most everybody expected me as, as, as pastor of one of the supporting churches to support the program and uh, the teacher and the school board. But I couldn't. Here's why. First, I had two young children. My daughters, Meredith and Emily, uh, were about to, ten to attend a school where uh, the program was underway. The Bible teacher was, was, was from either a, a Pentecostal church or an independent uh, Bible church. Um, and the truth was, I did not want my children learning the Bible or learning about God from any place but our church or from around our family table. Yes, but, but the teacher is just reading Bible stories, people would say. I mean, what could that hurt? And, and think of all the children who, who, who have no church. This is the only religious instruction that they may ever receive. But I believed, however, that just reading the Bible was not as benign as, uh, as some would make out. I knew that six-year-olds and seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds uh, would ask questions of the stories and, uh, and what they meant. The, the Bible teacher would, would certainly answer the questions from her own particular religious uh, perspective. Now, I believed that religious teaching is the responsibility of the church and of the family. Second, I understood that it was unfair, it was insensitive to have a, uh, a Christian Bible teacher teach Jewish children and non-Christian children who were also attending the public schools there. If we, who were in the majority power, did not stand up for the minority Jews and other non-Christians, then, then who would? And third, Public schools are um, an arm of the government, an institution that is supposed to be neutral toward religion by law and spirit. That's part of what July the 4th is all about and what our celebration of freedom is, is all about. Of course, this, this issue of the separation of church and state has always been a source of tension uh, in American society. I mean, we've often seen the debates uh, surrounding uh, prayer in the, in, the, in the public schools. But, but what I've always known is that as, as long as there are tests, there will always be prayer in the public schools, right? What bothers me much more is when politicians turn matters of faith into matters for votes and use religious issues to divide people for political gain. You with me? The price, the price for our religious freedom is our tolerance and our playing fair. 
And what is so tricky, of course, about this is we all have such passion for our faith. Such passion for God, such passion for the beliefs uh, that we have. And it is easy sometimes for our passion to turn into intolerance with those who, who disagree with us about how to believe or, or what to believe. Which does not mean that we Christians are somehow saying that that. What we believe about Jesus Christ as, uh, as Lord of our life and Savior of the world is, is, is somehow watered down. No, the depth of our commitment does not mean that, that somehow we impede the religious freedom of others who may believe very differently from how you and I believe. Did you hear Paul in his letter to the Galatians? I mean, Paul is writing to this, this young church uh, in Galatia, which is now modern-day Turkey, and this is what he writes. He says, For freedom, Christ has set us free. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, he writes, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hear that? Paul is saying that our freedom in Christ is linked somehow to our love for others. Our love for others pushes us to seek freedom for those who, who don't have it so that love and freedom are linked. And for me, the spiritual issue is don't we as Christians have to be concerned about freedom for those who don't have it? I mean, isn't that what practicing love is all about? Which is why we in the Presbyterian Church and other mainline churches uh, reversed ourselves on the historic biblical interpretations of, uh, of, uh, of slavery and the civil rights of uh, African Americans and the equality of women and the inclusion of gay and lesbian uh, people. In each of those discussions, Scripture could be found supporting slavery and supporting the inequality uh, of races, of supporting the subservience of women and condemning gay and lesbian people. But when those very issues are examined uh, hearing the words of Jesus or hearing the words of Paul that we just read where he says, for freedom Christ has set you free, for you were called into freedom, for the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul's letter to the Galatians, Galatians is sometimes called the Magna Carta of the New Testament, where Paul would also say in this same letter, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Uh, Simon Bolivar led uh, Peru to independence uh, from Spain in 1824, which is the year that First Presbyterian was established. And after he did it, the people there uh, pleaded with him to, to become the first president. But he said that his work was the work of liberation and that governance was better suited for others who had those skills. 
But they wanted to honor him, so they gave him a gift of a million pesos. So he then used all that money to purchase the freedom of nearly 3,000 men and women who were still slaves to other Peruvians. And this is what he said. It makes little sense to free a nation unless all its citizens enjoy freedom as well. That's the gospel, isn't it? I mean, Christ, the liberator, taking away the chains that imprison us and giving us instructions to, to love others the way that Christ uh, loves us. Our freedom as Christians is often very different than the way many in our culture understand freedom. Many understand freedom as, uh, as being free to do whatever you want to do, often uh, described in our individual rights. But as Christians, we have a different lens and a, and a different understanding of freedom. Freedom is linked to loving our neighbor which means freedom is, is always linked to community and to the common good uh, for others. So fire up the grill this Wednesday and let us celebrate our freedom. But let us remember that for us as Americans, religious freedom is at the top of our list.